exterior improvements this uh, as i said goes at the end you know planting uh, grass trees topsoil basically the way to do these estimates is by area if you have uh, grass you know and the different trees they, there will be a list of items the trees that you need to to uh, provide so then you count them and you provide the cost using our smiths roads uh, to, to the job site are important uh, an important part of the the estimate so you can see uh, in this picture you have uh, some machinery some equipment that lays down the uh, asphalt then we have a rotor that comes back and compacts that asphalt and we have a sort of a, a, a large crew here so the, the the cost becomes very heavy per hour the good thing about it is that they can do their work very fast so uh, in terms of time it goes really fast so it's not too expensive <laughs> this uh, video of uh, how a road would be made You see, it goes pretty fast. That machine can cover a good amount of area in a short period of time. You have the the asphalt itself. You have the cost of equipment, and all of your creators are working around. And then the rotor to uh, compact the asphalt to make it uh, very, you know, uh, flat and sturdy. So those are the, the typical uh, items that you will have in a, in a uh, asphalt road. Basically, you um, you figure out the area that you want to to cover, and then look at the tables find out the cost per square foot, it's going to have, um, the, the tables are going to have different costs depending on the thickness for that asphalt. So, you know, the, the, the specifications of the drawing will say how many inches you have. Yes. How long do you have to wait to go from the roller, I mean sorry, from the hot asphalt to the roller? You can do that right away. Right? Yeah, do that right away. And, um, you know, the, 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 there is a big debate about doing uh, roads in concrete or in uh, asphalt, you know. And it, it all depends on, on really what uh, materials do you have uh, on site. What is your... your what's, what's the debate? <coughs> well, what is the debate about? should we do the roads uh, with asphalt or should we do them with uh, concrete? Asphalt. It depends. I think asphalt. It depends. Asphalt. Asphalt. Concrete is too rigid. Yeah. Concrete is too rigid. So too rigid. Have, yeah, when you have heavy trucks on it, it will crack faster. Yeah. So what about asphalt? Is more flexible. Mm. Depending on the soil. It depends on the soil. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I uh, 
I was in, in, in the job site that I was working in Venezuela, we were looking at, the, at both uh, possibilities. And it turned out for us a lot cheaper to do them in concrete because we had a, a uh, concrete plant very, very close by. And uh, for economical reasons, it was a, a lot cheaper to us, uh, for us to do that. And, and then, uh, you know, we, we had heavy machinery going in and out and they, the, the concrete did not crack. Now, the, there has been a lot of uh, debate because the, in, in South Florida, concrete is sort of uh, inexpensive. You have a lot of the, the materials required to make concrete here. So then the concrete associations are trying to promote the use of concrete on roads. And they, of course, they say that the, the, um, the asphalt tends to, to settle down more than the concrete, so it requires more maintenance. You have to you know, resurface every three years, whether with uh, concrete it's a 20 years deal. So you know, there is uh, all those, that discussion and seeing you know, which way is better. All right. Yes. Do you have a question? No. I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that, I think that depends on the weather too, because mm -hmm. up north they change the asphalt every year because of the snow. The machinery right. that you use for to remove the snow damage the, the asphalt damage that you have to asphalt. remove every year. Then it's the same cost. Yeah. It's, it's an additional cost associated with. With Weather. the maintenance of the, the roads, yeah, of course. It's going to scrape also the, the concrete, right? And then uh, you, you'll require more maintenance and resurfacing. Yeah. All right, then uh, we go into concrete. Again, the concrete, same thing as uh, before. We have the st uh, estimate labor, materials, equipment, subcontractors. For concrete, uh, you, you have a a uh, sort of a, a, a muddy type of uh, fluid that it, it is formed with uh, uh, cement, most of it, then gravel, aggregates, uh, sand. So it's this uh, uh, fluid type of uh, mixture. And, and because it, it's uh, fluid-like, you need to have some sort of a form to hold the concrete in place. Uh, so then you, you need to estimate the cost of the formwork, how are you going to hold that concrete in place, and then you need to estimate the cost of the materials. Um, you, uh, th there is typically uh, some loss of uh, materials uh, due to uh, you know, uh, the operation itself, it's very messy. So there is going to be a, a recommended 5% for footings, 8% for slabs and waste factor. Some, depending on where you look, some authors will tell you 10%. So it, it really depends on, on what you, your operation looks like. Uh, sometimes it can be more, sometimes less. Why is it more for slabs than for? Because of the, the when you have the, the trucks, there is always some leftover that cannot be used. So because you have to, you know, they clean the, the truck and that gets dumped into the floor. So you, you have to buy that because there is no, you know, you need to take it into the consideration. And the slab takes more of these trucks than a small footing. So, you know. And sometimes you can, you, can, you can mix the concrete that you need for a, a spot mooring on a footing on a, on a wheelbarrow. So then your waste factor is a lot less than if you have a, a, a larger uh, mixture. They, they do uh, concrete testing, they do different type of testing. One of those is the cone um, test, where they, they fill up a cone, this cone, and they, they put it uh, upside down, and they look at how much this concrete um, goes down, settles down, and that gives them a, an early indication of um, the strength for that concrete. They do also the little um, cylinders that get tested on the lab, and that, that gives a better uh, estimate on their strength. Then uh, you, you, to, to create, uh, to, to make concrete, you need uh, uh, some sort of a mixer. Uh, where you put in the ingredients, you know, the, the uh, sand, the cement, the aggregates, and so on. 
you may to have you may have uh, some special additives for curing, uh, for color, for the strength. Uh, there are different type of uh, things that you can add into concrete. I mean, it's amazing. We uh, we did a a, a, a tank uh, to hold water out of concrete, and we had to add some special additives to prevent the water from. Uh, uh, permeating the, the concrete over time. So, well, again, uh, similar to the to the asphalt that we saw before, you have to consider, are you renting the equipment? Is that yours? Are you owning the equipment? You need the operators, we need people to put the concrete in place, and we need vibrators to take the air out of the concrete. There's a lot of things that could go on, and, on with the concrete. Just for your information, I, um, we, we have a, a competition, a student competition. This is only for undergrads, so I didn't invite you guys. The, the competition is cool because it's um, creating a, uh, a, a bowling ball out of concrete. So then the student have to figure out how to create this ball, right? And uh, it has to have certain weight, has to have certain strength, and uh, and then it has to have also the shape, right? It has to be uh, very, very, very circular, you know, it's, it's spheric. They're going to test it by, by rolling it down a, a hill and then striking some bowling pins, you know? So they, they, they all obviously have to roll straight, and, and it's cool. I, I had the, the students working on that last week and, you know, figuring out how to do this thing. That's pretty good. Take a, a bowl, you make a form, and then you put uh, it inside. Yeah, <laughs> what form are you going to use? You know, you it's going to be spheric, right? And no, 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 you, no, no, you, you, you take a bowl and you create the form with, with a... Uh, with a real one. You with a real one. one. So you take a real one, you make a form, and you, then you, you have to create, you have to, you have to know how to do it, to create the two forms, because you have to then split it and then... Tied it again and pour the concrete inside. That's one way. There you go. Done. Yeah, that's one way. Yeah, it's very easy to say. Now go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. No, no, no. Then go ahead and do it. Actually, it's uh, the same principle of a, of a, sculpt, a sculptor. Mm -hmm. If you you know how to do an sculptor, you you know how to replicate something. Mm -hmm. But if you have the bow, if you don't have the bow, how you do? It? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well. So uh, that that uh, competition brought me uh, some ideas. I'm, I'm thinking I'm teaching the estimated two class in undergrad. I'm thinking to divide the class into groups and have them actually estimate the the concrete ball. You know what is the volume, what is the weight, how you figure out the correct mix to make the the weight, and then go ahead and do it and estimate the cost of doing that ball. You know estimate it beforehand so you just you know, you, you think about what are you going to do, estimate the cost, then go ahead and do it and compare what you have estimated versus what you have actually spent, you know? So, uh, for, for guys like you that have experience and so on, that may be uh, silly, but for undergrad students, I think it's going to be fun. All right, so the, the, the concrete, we have this uh, concrete mix, and then we have the reinforcing also, the uh, metal reinforcing. Normally the, the concrete is really good to withstand um, uh, pressure, but it cracks under tension. So that's why we use uh, metal bars to create a, a, a structure, a reinforced structure that is good under tension and under compression. So the, the, these uh, reinforcing bars are, are plain circular uh, round type of uh, bars with grooves that hold the concrete in place. And then uh, what we do is we do the uh, linear takeoff. And, and then we figure out what is the weight and the cost is usually uh, per ton. So in, in, in most cases, these bars come in 20 feet uh, long bars. So we need to estimate the um, the, the, the length, uh, how many bars do we need, or how many linear feet, or how many tons we need, depending on, on what is the easiest way to, to estimate. You know, sometimes we'll have uh, uh, 
um, linear footings that are very easy to estimate uh, by linear feet. Other cases like this one, then it's a it's an area that needs to be covered with the rebar um, separated at certain distances, so it becomes a little bit more challenging. But still, it's the, it's the same principle. And, and, and the one thing to take into consideration is as we were talking about before, these bars get uh, overlapped one over the other one and then tied in for strength. So we need to take into consideration that overlapping um, because if not, we're going to be short on the number of, uh, on the quantity of material that we are estimating. There's other type of reinforcing also, the mesh, uh, welded wire mesh, WWM. Uh, this comes in rows, so basically it will cover an area. You have also a, um, very, uh, uh, an overlapping on the sides and the ends of these rows. So that, that's another way to provide reinforcing to the concrete. We may have uh, some accessories like uh, expansion joints uh, and joint feelers. Uh, this is done because the, the concrete, when you have a structure and you come in with concrete again to prevent cracking due to uh, thermal expansion, we install the, uh, an expansion joint so that uh, prevents the concrete from breaking. Other uh, accessories that are also made of uh, concrete, typically uh, manholes. These are structures that allow um, workers to get down to a, a sewer line or to a, a, a um, underground utility by uh, means of uh, stairways encased inside a um, cylinder of uh, concrete. So these these blocks are, are sold like Legos, you know, you put them inside and then uh, you, you basically complete your assembly. And the, the best way to estimate this is by counting a uh, number of items. So you count how many sections you need, how many of these manholes, and then put in the covers and, and multiply by the unit cost. Then uh, the, the last step of the concrete is to, to provide a, a smooth finish uh, on, on the top and, and different, different jobs will have different type of uh, finishing. It may go from something as simple as a moving uh, a bar on top of the, the surface to um, the broom type of uh, finish that is very, it's the most uh, used, or using machines that uh, provides a, a, um, a finish to the concrete. Uh, then um, we, we may have uh, formwork uh, to hold the concrete in place. It could be used different types. We have uh, metal work, uh, wood work. There's different, different types. I'm going to show a, a metal type of system that uh, comes together with um, plates and then uh, supporting elements. Hold it in place. The forms? Yeah, you reuse the forms, absolutely. These are made of forms that can be used over and over and over. Like, uh, th this is a, a job in, in Venezuela again where I, I was working. Uh, you can see the, the heavy metal work that goes uh, around the, uh, ring, the, the, the reinforcing. So, this, the way that this uh, build, uh, building was built is you have the concrete form for half of the building. So you put it on, you pour that half of the building, you wait, then you strip the forms, you put it on the other side because it's a, a mirror image, and then you pour again. So then you go and, and you do, you know, um, I think you I've go. been seeing those buildings. Hmm? I think I've been seeing those buildings. You have? Yeah, probably. They can be seen from the highway. <laughs> yeah. I spent like six months over there. Then we have uh, spot footings where we have one uh, footing in, in, a, in a specific area. So it's, uh, it's easy to estimate because the volume is basically the area times the height, right? And then uh, you may have the uh, column and you, you have some river uh, that goes up to uh, reattach you know, for, for the rest of the column. So basically after you, you, you dig in, you pour your concrete, and then you have to do the backfilling. 
right? This is uh, easy to estimate, you know, the volume, its height and width times length. Uh, you use a form work that may be uh, basically 12 inch high uh, wood uh, pieces tied together and then you pour your concrete in between. Those uh, wood forms can be used one, twice, maybe up to three times, and after that you cannot use them anymore. Um, here's a picture of a uh, rectangular uh, formwork for, for a, a, a footing, spot footing, uh, some pictures of rebar, some pictures of uh, how the uh, river can be uh, complex in concrete uh, structures for columns. So again, the, the volume is uh, easy to calculate. The forms are in linear in, in square feet, and then the rebars and ties, you basically count them and figure out the weight. Uh, sometimes you have uh, columns that are around rather than rectangular, so the calculation for the volume, it's a little bit different, but it's not, you know, not a big deal. Pi times the diameter divided by two squared times the height, that gives you the volume of uh, concrete for a uh, round column. The forms, uh, they, they could be different type of uh, forms. Some of those are, are prefabricated, they, they come in two sections, so you bore them together and you pour your concrete uh, uh, column. Uh, rebars, again, counted items. This is a, a picture of a continuous footing. So you have you know, a, a long run with your rebar and the, the pouring of the concrete. So you have to do the estimate of the volume again uh, on concrete and then the rebar. The, the, Sometimes, depending on the soil conditions, uh, like in this picture, you don't need to use uh, formwork. You use the, the soil as the walls that, that hold together the, the uh, footing. So that, that's uh, interesting. And uh, on-screen takeoff can help you to figure out the, the areas for uh, formwork because uh, if, you, if you estimate the uh, the linear condition for that uh, footing, right? You add width and you add height. In you, unit of measure two and three, you can estimate surface areas. So that can give you the surface that you need for your uh, formwork. Here's a, a picture of the foundation wall. So you have a, a footing, you have your column, you have the uh, the, the reinforcement inside those uh, columns, and uh, you have to estimate again, you know, the concrete volume, the river, and then the um, the uh, formwork. The the one important thing to do is not double count the the corners. You know, sometimes let me erase this a little bit here. The communication center also. Sometimes uh, when you're estimating concrete, you have corners, right? So you have a, a, um, a footing that goes somewhere like this, right? So when, when, when you're estimating, you take this uh, distance, right? Let's say to the end of, um, of this footing, right? And then when you're doing the horizontal, you may want to break this up to here and then start on this section. So this corner is not double count. Okay. Sometimes people go from here to here and then from here to here, and yeah. what happens is this here, oh, yeah. this corner is counted twice. So you have to be careful not to uh, double count the corners when you're doing your, your estimates. Beams uh, are very similar to the uh, foundations. Uh, they they may come also uh, prefabricated, so then it's counting items. You count uh, those items. You may have the delivery to the site plus the cost of the engineering the, the beam and uh, making the beam. Uh, if it is a poor on site, like the picture on the left, then it's the same thing as the footing. You have your formwork, 
you have your concrete, you have your reinforcement, then you go ahead and estimate that. In, in these uh, prefabricated structures, you, you may have to set up a, a crane, right? Uh, and, and you will have a, a crew of individuals placing that uh, beam uh, in place. So you have the cost for transportation, the cost of the crane, and then the installation cost. So on top of those uh, beams and, and, and columns and that structure that holds together the, the building, you need to have also uh, floors, right? So one of the, the typical construction methods is by using these uh, raised slabs. So these are metal slabs that have some shear connectors. You, you add some uh, reinforce to it and then pour the concrete on top of it. So you need to estimate the volume of concrete, then you need to add the reinforcement and so on. Stairs uh, normally um, belong to different divisions, but you may have stairs made out of uh, concrete. So then you want to include those stairs in your concrete estimate. Um, Again, you need labor to put the, the forms, to strip the forms, to pull out the concrete, and uh, to set up the concrete joists if you have precast structures. Here you have a, a picture of those, uh, pre, the, those metal forms put in place with the reinforcing in, the, in between, and then the laborers are uh, using a, a concrete hose to pour concrete in between the two forms. So that, that's uh, one way to do it. Um, as I said before, you, you may need uh, some of these equipment to get the concrete in, in place. We talked a little bit about the uh, manholes and, and uh, access to drainage and, and sewer lines. And here is a picture of the sewer line itself, also made of uh, concrete. So you, you see these concrete lines come in, in, in pieces. So you have to estimate how many of these pieces you need and put them together. Here is a, a table that shows you some uh, cost in uh, concrete uh, pipe. So it gives you the diameter and then uh, the cost uh, per section, depending if you have gaskets or, or not, and you know, different type of things. Uh, another uh, element that gets uh, put in place uh, is, is the vapor barrier to prevent uh, moisture from the ground to get into the concrete when you're pouring a slab. So basically you, you, you prepare the, the soil, you put in your uh, gravel, your sand, your, your bed of uh, materials, you compact this and then put on top of it a, a vapor barrier. These vapor barriers come in rolls so you will have side overlapping and end overlapping. And what you want to do is estimate the area that you need to cover, divide that by the effective area of the roll, right? Remember that we talked about that? It's the area of the roll minus the overlapping. And then that gives you the number of rolls that you need. And it's basically, you know, just how much area you need to cover for that vapor barrier. The vapor barrier may have different thickness and different materials, so you have to look into the specifications to determine which one you want. Yes. The overlapping scheme uh, is specified by the vendor? Yes. Okay. Yes. So they, they will tell you when you have one roll next to the other one, how much overlap you need on the side. Exactly. And when you have at the end, you know, how much overlap you need on the end. So it tells you both ways. And then it, it, uh, it becomes just uh, multiplying how many rows you need by their unit cost and you get the vapor barrier cost.